Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 7th, 2017, and we're recording this episode of Econ Talk in front of a live audience in New York City as part of Atlas Network's Liberty Forum. And I have to say, our hotel is on Broadway, and this is probably as close as I'll get to being performing on Broadway. <laughs> uh, I did perform off, off Broadway as Adam Smith, but uh, in a certain dimension, this, this is better. Atlas Network encourages and supports free market think tanks around the world with the goal of increasing economic freedom, and we're going to talk more about their specific activities. We have two guests today, Matt Warner and Simeon Diankoff. Matt is the chief operating officer of Atlas Network. Simeon Diankoff is director of the Financial Markets Group at the London School of Economics, and he's the creator of the Doing Business Report at the World Bank, which has been mentioned on Econ Talk as part of the World Bank's assessment of development efforts and economic policy around the world. Uh, the Doing a Business Report is an attempt to measure the red tape and other barriers to business activity in now 190 countries. And uh, Simeon is also the former Minister of Finance of Bulgaria, which is an unusual uh, experience for a, a PhD economist, actually done things mm-hmm. in the real world. Simeon and Matt, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, our topic for today is going to be economic development and what we know and don't know about the government's role in the process. As a jumping off point, I want to start with this report I mentioned, the Doing Business Report uh, from the World Bank. Uh, Simeon was the founder of that report. It was first published in 2003. There have been 15 annual reports since then, or 15 reports, probably at one year there were two. But here's a quote from the current report to give you an idea of what this uh, report tries to measure. Quote, doing business measures aspects of regulation affecting 11 areas of the life of a business. Ten of these areas are included in this year's ranking on the ease of doing business. Here they are. Starting a business, dealing with construction permits, getting electricity, registering property, getting credit, protecting minority investors, paying taxes, trading across borders, enforcing contracts, and resolving insolvency. Doing business also measures features of labor market regulation, which is not included in this year's ranking, and a little bit later we'll talk about why that is. But I want to start off, Simeon, how did you come about this whole idea of trying to measure uh, the ease of doing business in countries around the world? The idea came from learning from better economists, uh, two types of economists uh, at the time. One was from the experience of Hernando de Soto. You remember uh, his, uh, his books, uh, Really the Other Path, and then the, the uh, book about uh, the mystery of capital, where Hernando de Soto makes this point about, in his own country, Peru, how people don't have access to uh, formal uh, property registration, formal business registration, because it is too complicated. And actually, he is the first one in his book who sort of makes this life cycle of the firm uh, comment, which is to say, well, let's look at every firm or every country in the world, and then let's look uh, what's the intent of government towards these companies. Does, Does the government want more companies? Does the government want companies that are in the informal sector? Because otherwise, perhaps, um, it becomes uh, complicated from uh, the perspective of the firms that the the government supports, either directly or indirectly. So Hernando de Soto was the first inspiration. And the second inspiration came from my uh, region, Eastern Europe, where economists like Václav Klaus, the former president of the Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic, Leszek Balcerowicz of uh, Poland, ask this very interesting question for our economists, which is, if you start from a situation where there was no private sector at all, how do you go about creating the regulatory environment for the new private sector? What would you do? And maybe what 
you would not want to do because you've seen the bad examples from abroad. So these were the two intellectual uh, inspiration points that we took. So how do you go about, when you started the survey, I think you started with 145 countries. It's grown to 190. How do you execute that strategy? You, you could sit in an armchair, as we're doing today, and you could look through the legislation and regulatory books of a particular country, and you could simulate, essentially, uh, what it would take to, say, start a business. There's many different, these, there's 11 factors, but uh, did, is that what you did? I think that's what Hernando de Soto did in some countries. He actually went from ministry to ministry, collecting the permits. Sometimes they had to wait a certain amount of time before the permits came back, and they got some empirical measure. Were you doing something similar, and is that still what's being done with the Doing Business Report? Very similar to Hernando de Soto's original uh, design, except uh, Hernando de Soto had one think tank behind him, while we had, I had the World Bank behind me. <laughs> and the World Bank has offices in 170 countries. It has 16,000 people around uh, the world. So we followed Hernando de Soto's original design, but then we asked our network of offices, if you like, can you please, this is what we think happens by just reading the laws and uh, the regulations of your country. And we have every law, every regulation that affects business in all these countries around the world. But please, can you basically be our uh, guinea pig? avatar, guinea pig, guinea. yes, and go and actually see what, uh, what uh, happens. So we followed exactly this design. And uh, to the st- To our surprise, it worked because you would think, well, it's one thing to do it in one country. It's another thing to do it in 190 countries around uh, around the world. But it worked and it has worked every year for the last, as you mentioned, 15 years. Now, when economists do empirical work or theoretical work, a lot of times no one pays any attention to it. This report, people pay a lot of attention to, at least according to the Wikipedia page, for it, I think it's the number one downloaded report. It's cited in about a zillion academic studies. Of course, it's a wonderful uh, source of data for running statistical analyses, which, of course, development economists like to do. But give me, in your words, your assessment of how much attention countries around the world are paying to these rankings. And, and I should mention, after you've done all this, you create an index. You weight all the scores on each dimension you create an index, and then you rank countries. So you go from one, which I think in the, in the new, I don't think, in the new ranking, it's New Zealand. Correct. And I think the last, the 190th country in ease of doing business is uh, Somalia, which that's it. Both of those are somewhat intuitive. There's some surprises along the way. But a country wakes up one day and sees their 17th or 38th. Do they care? Does anybody care? They do care. Uh, at first, we were a bit surprised, actually, how much we cared. And then when we started to meet mostly irate government <laughs> officials, they would say, uh, we're much better than uh, what you're <laughs> presenting us as. And then we'd go to the private sector of that country, and they would say, actually, they're much worse than what you're <laughs> presenting. So nobody was happy um, early on. And, of course, the World Bank uh, bureaucracy, our country directors, had to face these irate governments on a daily basis. And uh, that was not very pleasant uh, either. But I think the, the reason that it works is, uh, is maybe twofold. One, as you mentioned, there is an index. So every year you are ranked. Uh, and many government officials, not in a polite way, have said this is like the World Cup, basically, in uh, soccer or the Super Bowl in uh, in, uh, in football, that basically you, in some sense, compete with everybody else. And it's great. It's a great feeling if you're ahead, so you start <laughs> boasting, uh, boasting a lot. If you're behind, you first, of course, blame the, the people who've put together the index. Sure. But eventually you figure out, well, we might as well try to change. And we've seen over this period uh, how the same governments... Russia's government is a good example. The same government has been around for all of these 15 years. Went from truly annoyed, well, very irate, truly annoyed, not so annoyed. Well, we might as well do something about it. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, they're in this, uh, in this stage uh, now. And we see other governments like the government of China, which has been waiting to see how others respond and suddenly decides, yeah, we would also compete. Do you worry? I mean, I would worry when I look at it. I 
I wonder how it accurately represents what's actually going on to the ground. We're going to talk about that in a little bit in more detail, but there's always a problem of what we would call teaching to the test. They'll figure out how the score is created, and then they'll do some lip service, we'd worry, uh, to the requirements of the score, and then, but they wouldn't actually change anything on the ground effectively for businesses. You have a field that it's actually making a difference. So you might want to use Russia as an example. I, mean, I know they've, quote, improved. Um, so you could tell us about that, but I, I guess the question I would have then is, well, they've improved their score. Is it a better environment for starting a business and running a business uh, than before those changes, and, and how would you know? So the second part of our index, so we do this uh, Hernando de Soto type of study where on our own we basically go through the process of starting a new company. We actually do that process to the point of starting the new company or paying for taxes of this company and so on. But in addition to that, which was not done uh, by Hernando de Soto's team, we also ask local uh, law firms, local consulting firms, local think tanks, to basically also answer our questionnaire. And this is not just what's on the book, but is it actually done the way that the governments are supposed to do it? Because our methodology, as you uh, correctly pointed out, to be consistent across countries, it basically assumes that the government is perfect, nobody gets sick, nobody takes bribes, and we actually get often this question, well, we did our own survey and actually firms uh, did uh, the start the registration of a business much faster. Why is that the case? Well, because everybody paid bribes, and we don't really want uh, to capture the fact that in most countries around the world, to get around red tape, you just either use your, uh, uh, let's say, your contacts or simply pay, pay bribes. So we want to know what is the norm, what the government wants uh, business to be like. Too complicated, not too complicated, and you see this huge differentiation. You mentioned Somalia. But, you know, one country that has been sliding uh, uh, down the rankings very quickly is Venezuela. Over the last about decade, Venezuela used to be actually among the better countries in Latin America about a decade ago. Now it's actually 188. So it's just Somalia, Eritrea, Venezuela. It's, it's, It's gone so far down. And just to finish with one example. So if you want to start just a very basic company, uh, in Venezuela, currently it takes 20 different government agencies. So you basically have to go 20 different uh, government offices. 230 days if you are perfect. So you basically right. have a fleet of cars that drives you around and so on. And you need to pay the equivalent of five, five times income per capita. So in the U.S., it, this would be something like $200,000 just in government fees. And to give a comparison, in the United States, how long would it take? So it's in Venezuela, 230 days, days. five times per capita income in the United States, which I think ranks sixth in the recent report. What's, do you know those numbers off the top of the your The United head? States is not the best in the world. Right. New Zealand Six. is online. You do it now. We can do it. The two of us can do it literally in 10, 10 minutes in New Zealand. The United States, it takes about two days because you need to go to two different government agencies, one municipal, one, uh, one central. But actually, one of them you can do online. One, you need to visit the local municipality. And the cost? And the cost is very trivial. It's about $180. In the United States. In the United States. And Actually, just te- in New York City, where we are. Just a technical detail. Uh, obviously, there are differences across uh, geography within a country. Uh, these numbers are typically, I, th- I think, for the capital city? For the largest business uh, cities, which most of the time is the capital city. Was- uh, Washington is not, however, the largest business city. So we, we follow New York. But in countries that are above 100 million population, there are 11 such countries. We mentioned China, India, Mexico, Indonesia, the United States. We actually measure more than one city. So in the case of the U.S., we measure New York, we measure L.A., Los Angeles, we measure Chicago. Should do Biloxi, Mississippi, maybe. Yeah, you get a little, <laughs> a little more variety. But, I, I, but I, I think the more important point, yeah, that was a joke, the more important point is, the, is consistency in some dimension of what you're trying to measure. So... Any one score, any one year is not so meaningful. Change, we hope, would have more significance. Uh, I want to go back to Russia for a minute. You told me an interesting story off air uh, about a recent uh, meeting in Russia related to the uh, the rankings. Tell that story. 
So the latest report just came out uh, literally a week uh, a week ago, and uh, it happened to be the day when the Russian Council of Ministers, the ministers of the, the cabinet. cabinet of Russia, was uh, meeting. Um, it looked like it's impromptu, but actually it was quite well uh, well well staged, where uh, President Putin, while discussing some other affairs, seemingly ca- seemingly casually asked the Minister of Economy, "So how do we do on the doing business ranking?" And the Minister of Economy, who was very well prepared, said, "Well, we're improving. We're doing quite well, especially relative to our neighbors." Um, but there are some indicators where we are not doing so well. And he looks towards his neighbor, the energy minister. President Putin, who is prepared, so he's reading comments, says, so we are 144 on um, uh, connecting electricity. Basically, if you have a business, you also want it to run on electricity, your computers and uh, so on. So he turns to the energy minister. This is all on televised, real TV um, cameras uh, rolling the whole council of ministers and says, why are we doing so badly? And the minister of energy is a bit, you know, befuddled. So he says, well, we're better than our neighbors, which is <laughs> Kazakhstan, Belarus, um, uh, not, not the best business environment in the world. Uh, President Putin looks at him and says, you should also compare to some other countries that are better than that. He pauses, looks at him and says, and if you don't, I know who can. This is all on, uh, on TV. You can see it on YouTube. The more things change, the more they stay the same. A little bit depressing, <laughs> but kind of. Um, one point I want to make, I make very clear to get your response to very important is that, and I, I brought this up in a recent episode, and, and some listeners who are not longtime listeners were, were confused by it. I said in a recent episode, being pro-business and pro-capitalist are not the same thing. And Some listeners are like confused. Well, of course, aren't they the same thing? The answer is absolutely not. Being pro-business is favoring one sector of the economy, often at the expense of consumers. Uh, I'm generally pro-consumer. The well-being of a country is measured best not by how easy it is to start a business, but how easy it is for that someone to start a business and thereby benefit other people. That usually requires competition uh, in a free market system. In a free market system, it's competition among businesses that restrain the natural self-interest of of the participants. And so one concern I would have, and I'd love to get your reaction, is uh, it's one thing to measure the ease of doing business. I would think you would also want to measure the ease of keeping out competitors, uh, the problems of rent-seeking, the problems that it might be easy to start a business for certain groups, but not so easy for others. And if barriers can be put up, uh, then they're, they're going to be uh, the ease of doing business is not going to measure how well the economy runs, but rather how well the business sector can exploit the rest of the economy. Does that, does that problem come up in the decision to design this work? Did it come up, and do you feel that that's a problem with the, with the index now? It's certainly a very valid uh, problem, especially once you go to some of the emerging markets, let's say, some regions like the Middle East comes to mind uh, immediately, where a large part of the formal private sector, I'm not talking about the state-owned sector, is uh, one way or another connected to the government, connected through networks, connected family. through family, uh, and so on. And just as you, uh, as you mentioned, I've actually had experiences in Morocco, for example, where I'd be sitting like this with their Minister of Economy, and he would be saying, no, it's much faster. You know, my nephew just established a business, and it was like took one day. And I'll be literally, well, hello, yes, because he's your nephew. And no, no, it's not because of my nephew. So I've literally, in that case, said, would you like us to go together now to the company registry and see how it works? That was great. We went there. It was around 10 in the morning. There was nobody. So it was just closed. <laughs> so, okay, so your nephew probably <laughs> went a different way. Went, the back, went to the back That's door. That's right. Yeah. But I can tell you for the average person, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot more difficult. So, but that's where actually our methodology helps because in some sense... Um, uh, it is a methodology of, uh, of an unknown person, one, one person that is just trying to establish uh, a, ba- a basic business. So it's not a complicated business, and it does not at that level challenge even in these governments the arrangement, let's say, that they have with, uh, with private uh, businesses and with state-owned enterprises. So that's also important to say that in some countries, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and so on, 
the government is thinking if we have too many successful private firms, the state-owned companies may go bust and then we're in trouble. Yeah, uh, a little scary. Now, you've recently looked at the impact of the ratings, that is, whether changes in the ratings are related to uh, poverty rates. Tell us about that work. Um, this work was actually inspired by uh, the Atlas Network, and um, they have been by now in 15 years around 10,000 actual academic articles that use doing business indicators and relate them to outcomes. Informality, as Hernando de Soto early on suggested, is very strongly correlated with having a lot of red tape. Makes sense, right? So if in Venezuela it takes 20 procedures and 230 days to establish a formal business, you don't do it. You just operate in the informal uh, economy. So there have been a lot of studies by our team, but also by others, looking at informality in economic growth. And, uh, it's quite robust that economic growth in countries with less red tape uh, is uh, significantly uh, higher. But the new topic was, well, can you correlate it with, uh, with poverty rates? And at first pass, you can say there are so many other indicators that poverty depends on. Wars and civil conflict is very important, you can immediately imagine. Kleptocratic governments is, uh, is, uh, is another one. So there are a number, health and education, but we decide, well, let's just do it. Let's uh, look at all these variables that we know about and issues, but also let's look at our variable. And somewhat to my surprise, I must admit, there is a very strong correlation so that uh, basically you can every 5% increase in our ranking. So as you go up just by 5%, you can reduce in the average country poverty by about one percentage point. That's significant. You know, the U.S. currently has about... 14.5% of the population under the poverty line, poor people. Well, if you can reduce 1% percentage points uh, of this just by changing some regulations, all the better for now, you. Econ Talk listeners will not be surprised that I'm skeptical of those kind of uh, claims. So let's dig into that a little bit. So one argument which I would think about is, is the problem of reverse causation. Right, so you have richer countries with lower poverty rates, generally have better governance. We don't know which direction that causation runs. It could be just that as you get wealthier and there's economies of scale and uh, there's more transparency in government, there's more, there's a more vibrant press. There's a lot of things that correlate with with uh, economic well-being that might also correlate with uh, Governance, regulation, effective regulation, regulation that's not pure red tape for no purpose. And so that might be a spurious correlation. In particular, it's hard to believe that the people who are in poverty today in the United States are being held back because somebody in, in their city can't start a business. It might not be their business. It could be they could benefit True. from other people starting businesses. But it, as opposed to, say, in a, in a, a particularly poor country where literally there are poor people who could – rise above poverty levels if they could just be a little more, have a chance to be a little more entrepreneurial and the government's holding that back either through the red tape or the informal constraints that are those bribes that, that might deter them. And I would have two answers for you. One is a, a, an economic observation that precisely because the levels may be affected by many other things, then you look at the change. So you ask the question, while all of these other factors matter, let's look at the change in poverty. So from last year to this year, where your, your health and education system hasn't really changed, and hopefully no war, new war has started. And, and your bureaucracy is as, just is, as corrupt as it was the year before. Exactly. Whatever then, level that is. <laughs> and then let's look whether that change can be affected by, by the change in the doing business indicators. And now that we have 15 years, we can look at this uh, change on change. So poverty rate, does it change when something good happens on our indicator? And we find very um, significant uh, uh, importance uh, of these indicators there. Again, in terms, of, uh, in terms of order, there are clearly many other things that matter, but this one matters as well. My second response is, even, if, even in a country like the United States, you mentioned in the overall indicator, the United States ranks currently sixth. But there are some uh, uh, sub-indicators, like paying taxes, that uh, the United States is not in the top 25. Actually, it's not in the top 50. What does 50. paying taxes mean? What, is, how do you, what does that mean? 
So what we measure is not just how much taxes you pay, which uh, for the average company in the U.S. is significantly more than companies in most of the world. On that sub-indicator, the United States, just to give you an idea, ranks 86th in the world. So it's basically in, uh, in the second half, if you like, of the, of the distribution, um, almost in the second half of the distribution. But it also covers not just how much you pay, but how complicated is it to pay. So can you do it online, fully online? In many countries, including in my own country, Bulgaria, actually you can pay everything online. You never have to basically write something, sign it, and send it. In the U.S., the corporations cannot do that. Some things they can, but some you still need to actually sign and uh, audit and send them. So the United States overall in this uh, indicator does quite badly. Now, I want to ask, I meant to ask this before about Venezuela. They're 188. Ten years ago, what were they? You think you said it. What was it? They're around number 70. So in about 10 years, you can slide 100 positions. What happened? Now, we know something of what happened, and we've talked about this in earlier programs about Venezuela's situation. There's price controls. There's um, all kinds of changes in policy. It's interesting to me as a non-Venezuelan specialist, and maybe you're not enough of one to answer it, but if you can, I'd love to hear it. What's happening in their regulations across this diverse set of this regulatory environment that, that is different? That, that, in other words, one thing you say, well, boy, things are worse there. Yeah, I think that's about 188th now. That's obviously not what you do. You're trying to actually measure in some measure of precision what's actually happened. Do you have a feel for what happened? Well, we can see what's happening in terms of the intent of government, which is that the government is trying to squeeze more and more out of the smaller and smaller private sector because they have so many problems uh, in terms of um, their fiscal deficit, in terms of what the government actually can get out of the private sector in terms of taxes. So they're trying to come up every year with more complicated regulations, essentially to be able to capture the whole private sector. The private sector responds by moving to the informal economy, just as you would expect. And the result is that these regulations become so ludicrous. But when you say squeeze, right? one way a government will squeeze the private sector is they'll raise tax rates. Right? Which they have. But that's one of your 11 measures. What else is going on there? Is it getting harder to start a business? You said it's 20, it's 20 uh, agencies and 203 days. Was it, that the case 11 years, 10, year, 10 years ago? Was, something, was it better? No, it was significantly easier. It was taking about a decade ago, it was taking half of the steps and about a third of the time. So the government, as I, as I suspect, is just trying to control business more and more. How do you control business? By putting more regulations, more agencies. In. So a good example. In Venezuela, in order to start your business, you have to have a number of records checked by the police, by the Ministry of Defense. In which other country do you need to... To, to have a check by the Ministry of Defense, not the Interior Ministry, that you are fit and proper to run a business. But I think this is a, a way of controlling people, not just businesses, a way of controlling people, and not just in terms of economic uh, uh, well-being, if you like, but also, if you like, politically. Now, there's two reasons that governments might create an environment that's not very uh, friendly toward entrepreneurship, uh, which is interesting when you say entrepreneurship. It, it, that sounds so much better than business, doesn't it? Crazy. Uh, that sounds like, well, that's a good thing. You don't want to be unfriendly to entrepreneurship. Friendly to business, ooh, that's cronyism, which of course it can be. So we could think of a couple of reasons that firms might, I mean, the countries might and governments might not do a great job in, this er- in these areas. Uh, one would be stupidity, uh, incompetence, um, just the complexity of the world. They don't realize that there's 20 steps now and there used to be 10. The other is they're getting something out of it, either for the gains of the officials involved, the bribes, uh, rent-seeking by uh, the politicians to attract people paying them those, not just bribes, but donations. Uh, I've told the story recently of the St. Louis restaurateur I used to know who would give monies to, money to both Democrats and Republicans. I said, why do you do that? He said, well, you know, I might need to ask a favor of one of them. <laughs> Because they have all these hoops I have to jump through, and that, that makes sense. You have a feeling for the, the countries that woke up one day and realized, oh my gosh, we're 114th, we got to do something about it. Was it just a matter of, of realizing, oh, we're not doing very well, we've got a more complex system than we wanted, or did they wake up and then realize, oh, too many vested interests here, i got to keep things the way they are? 
in many countries, it's, 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 the system is designed basically to extract bribes, and you extract bribes at the level of the public official that is giving you some sort of small piece of paper, but it also percolates up towards the higher-level government officials. So it is a fiefdom system, if you like, and, re- and this type of regulation is a way to control, uh, uh, to control uh, the private sector. But they are con- uh, because of bribes and because of what you uh, take. There is uh, another, uh, let's say, um, sense of that, which you already uh, mentioned, which is that in that way you also control in certain sectors, basically, your competitors. So if in the Moroccan example the minister has a nephew, nephew who is in the telecom sector, well, no other firm is going to be created in the telecom sector for some, um, uh, for some time. And finally, and I think this is where the Venezuela example is uh, very pertinent, it's a way to control um, your opposition, and I mean your political opposition, not your economic opposition, because who would have an interest in a stable and uh, uh, economically viable society? Well, it's the middle class. But the middle class, if you see, is that politicians don't do what they're supposed to do, may want to rebel and finance an opposition uh, leader or movement. Well, how do you squash that? Basically removing the opportunity of the private sector by taking them out, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, what's going on in India these days? You had a nice story that, again, you share with me before we, we begin recording. India, ha- India has been trying for years to improve, not just on these indicators, and I should say that these indicators usually are an entry point to a discussion with government officials that, you know, your economy can be doing a lot better, it can be a lot freer if you look at issues of competition in particular, um, towards foreign companies or towards your own uh, small entrepreneurs. So it's an entry point. But uh, the Indian government has been literally for the last 15 years trying to improve, and it's always been around rank 135. It has not changed. Over this period of 2003 the, to the present? 15-year Because uh, period. I, I assume that it has changed a lot since, say, 1970. Yes, from 2003 to, to now. Three years ago, in comes the uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, government currently in power, and literally within the first month of uh, his uh, uh, leadership, uh, Prime Minister Modi announces that within uh, his term, it's not specified how many terms he would have, but within his term, India will uh, get to number 50, which if you're 135, sounds like this is never going to happen, but okay, it's good to, to try well, it encourages this... ministers to sabotage other countries' <laughs> yeah. political systems That's to right. make it easier to pass them, of course. It's not, there's a certain problem with the, this uh, It's a relative ranking, ranking yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if other countries start sinking like Venezuela, you may be going uh, up. That's true, but you need a lot of countries yeah, um, that's a lot of work. To, to do that. So, so over the last two, three years, the Indian government and private sector, actually, the business associations, have worked very hard to improve, and this year it actually happened. So they went from 130th to 100th, a very big uh, jump. It was, And I assume they also improved in absolute terms, because it wasn't just because... That's correct. And in, in absolute terms, they were actually the most significant improver of any country in the world. You're right, this is more important to, um, uh, to say. Um, there was a lot of interest in the government... Um, on when exactly the doing business report is going to be released. We always hide it so that uh, until the last moment, um, um, certain governments cannot pressure us. Um, But they timed it so that within the first half an hour of the report coming out electronically, I should mention an electronic report, it's free, you can find it online. And today is November 7th. This episode will come out in a few weeks. So as you're listening to this, we're talking on November 7th. The report came out on October 31st. Correct. So just uh, exactly one, uh, one week ago, Prime Minister Modi appears on TV, talks about uh, their big success. The Mumbai Stock Exchange goes up by 400 points, which is about $30 billion in added, uh, uh, in added wealth, if you like, uh, on the stock exchange. So that's a good measure of markets, uh, markets react. But more important, uh, perhaps... And it was a spike, it Not was a that. spike, that's right. So the market has been quite uh, quite uh, uh, flat, and just the announcement of the doing business uh, improvement in rankings got 397 points uh, up. 
Uh, but we also had a conversation with the uh, prime uh, prime minister of how how he views this uh, this uh, uh, ranking, and he made a, at first very strange comment. He said, "Well, it's like trying to lose weight." I said, "Okay, is he looking at me?" <laughs> <laughs> trying to lose weight, you know, unless you have scales to measure yourself, you never have sort of the. Um, the interest of really doing it. So doing business is like the scales of somebody who is trying to lose weight. But not only that, I, I know when, uh, when I'm successful, if a friend comes and says, oh, you look great, you've really lost lots of weight. So that's the competition across other countries for him. But so it's I mean, also, I would argue, it's also the business people in, in India who would tell the prime minister in informal conversations, right? Thank you. And I, the scale's way too precise. He should have said, <laughs> it's, like, it's like my belt. Yeah, okay. You know, my belt, every once in a while, if I'm lucky, I'm losing weight, I can move over one whole notch. But it's not a, I don't have a lot of notches, so it's a pretty crude measure. A lot of other things going on in the economy besides these, these 11 indices. Correct, correct. And you'd also want to argue, I didn't give you this, I wanted to give you a hard time before on the poverty thing. It's a very noisy relationship between the score and poverty. There's a, there's a, a negative relationship. The higher your score, the lower the poverty rate. But it's not a precise there's a lot of variance across countries. Do you have any idea in this one particular country? India made a big leap. Are there any signs that it's actually, again, translating into better lives for people on the ground? Um, I think it's too early to tell, frankly, because they have just improved. Uh, <laughs> but there is one way in, in, in which literally within a year or two years, you can see whether there is impact or not. If we are right about... Um, making it easier, reduce red tape, more businesses are going to develop, you first see in the number of new registrations. And that okay. in India already has just year on year, this year relative to the previous year, has improved by about 8 percentage points. So that's significant for a large, large country like uh, Was India. Was there a trend before of going up 8 percentage points every year About before? 2, 2.5% two okay. a year. It was going up, you're right, but you know now it's like three times more than the, the, the previous uh, two years. Uh, so that's one. And then within about two years, you actually start seeing some benefits in terms of uh, better tax collection because now you have a larger tax base. Yeah. That we're yet to see in India. And talk about the labor regulations. Um, I, this came up, I can't remember the episode. I'm, my listeners will probably pay better attention to this and tell us the answer. But in a recent episode, meaning in the last three or four years, somebody mentioned that the labor regulation component of this uh, report is controversial. And it, we know it is because for whatever reason, this year in the 2018 report, which just came out on this, October 31st of 2017, there's no labor regulation index. And I should clarify that you started this report. You worked on it for seven reports. Oh. You're not formally related to the uh, involved now. You're, you're tangentially involved. People, I'm sure, still talk to you from your old World Bank days and contacts. But for whatever reason, and I suspect you have an idea, what's controversial about the labor regulation report and why is it not included in these indices? And then if you want, you can speculate about how if they had included it, it would have changed some of the rankings. Well, it was, as you suggest, it was included in the first uh, nine years, actually, since the report started, because, of course, anybody who is in business can tell you that how um, uh, labor is uh, hired, fired, uh, maintained has a lot to do with how successful you're in your business or not. I think what happened, uh, and this is after I had left, uh, uh, I had left uh, the team, was that some countries were that coincidentally or not, did not rank on, uh, well on uh, labor, France in particular, was very upset about why is this included. And being that this is a report of, uh, of the World Bank, so it has a board of directors that has a lot of say of what is uh, happening, um, these directors managed to convince management that labor is not as important, essentially, for running a business. <laughs> Other things are more important, so excluded. Uh, so it was excluded after nine years of uh, collection. I mentioned France, which was one of the countries. Uh, China was another one uh, to Why mention. Why was China not happy about it? Because of the relative ranking, basically. And what was, do you have a feel for why China ranked poorly and why France ranked poorly? Well, in France, uh, as we know, you don't work that hard, and it's very, <laughs> it's very difficult to uh, get um, uh, hired, and it's impossible to get fired, basically. 
which makes uh, it harder to get hired. Precisely, <laughs> which then makes for a very large informal uh, market and for a very large part-time uh, labor force. The uh, Fra- France's labor force is about fo- uh, part-time labor force is about forty percent. So, in other words, four out of ten. Uh, uh, French workers uh, do not have uh, full-time employment. They only work partially. Why? Because in this way you can avoid the heavy, heavy labor regulation. I, I mention this because the current president, or the relatively recently appointed president of France, Macron, has elected. Ma- actually, you said appointed. I think you sorry, elected, elected <laughs> has been. Um, uh, part of his uh, success in the campaign was precisely to change labor regulation, and he, in fact, in his government last month has suggested sweeping uh, regulations to make it more flexible to hire workers, to fire workers, basically to become uh, more like uh, some of the successful countries in northern, uh, northern Europe. So he's going to be eager to see that included in future rankings, presumably. And it's a fascinating example of how any government can have its own measure. What's nice about this measure is that it's external. It's not gathered by your own bureaucrats. It's not gathered by your own political cronies. It's a it's perhaps extremely objective. It's certainly more objective than your domestic we gather data would be. And it's a way to bind yourself to the mast. It's a way to encourage political reform uh, by pleading, well, I, you know, I, I, I can't control this. This is just this measure, and we, we, we need to do better. So politically, I think it'd be very, it's very helpful to him. This is how, indeed, it is uh, used, and it would be very helpful if he manages, actually, to do the reforms that yeah, we'll he see. has set out uh, in front of his uh, government. If he is not successful, it would show, because there have been a number of countries, Italy comes to uh, mind uh, uh, three or four years ago, when the then Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Monti, a top economist, as you know, Boldly said, within a year, our labor regulation are going to be transformed and we are going to be as flexible as the Anglo-Saxon countries, New Zealand, Australia, UK, US. Two years passed, nothing happened. Basically, his, his attempts were killed in the Italian parliament. Yeah. Talk uh, is cheap for politicians, as we know. Now, we could spend the rest of the time on this next question. We're not going to because I, I want to give Matt a chance to talk. Matt's patiently sitting, uh, sitting over there and... Matt, we will get to you in a second, but, but I do want you to reflect a little bit, Simeon, on how the experience of gathering these data, interacting with domestic, in, within country actors who are dealing with these regulations, how that affected your time as a minister of finance. Uh, it's a crazy thing. Right, you had to put your money where your mouth was, or your time where your heart was, whatever you want to call it, and implement or try to implement some of the things you thought would make Bulgaria a more effective uh, economic system. Can you talk about that? Well, one thing that it certainly affected is the tactics of how to reform. In the sense that uh, certainly in uh, academia, you are basically told you need to think deeply. Then there are a lot of pressure groups, uh, lobbies, so you need to talk to them. You need to use the media for communicating the benefits of reform and so on. Some of the reformers, successful reformers that I spoke uh, with before I joined the Bulgarian government basically said, you go and on day one, you surprise everybody. You blitz. So you go in every direction you can because they'll be confused what's happening and you may actually be successful in some of the reforms. So this is what I did. I went to Bulgaria in um, late July 2009. The Eurozone crisis had already started around us. Greece was just about to, um, to collapse a few months later. So there was kind of a feeling that something needs to happen. But instead of going, let's now do labor reform, then let's do business entry reform. Uh, In the government, we literally went six or seven different directions, hoping that parliament will be, you know, confused or too happy to be elected. They were just elected. And we actually succeeded in most of these reforms. When I tried to do meaningful, well-explained reforms two years after, they would get bogged down because lobbying lobbying will essentially take over and uh, not now, let's wait for next government and so on. What's the most important thing you did or you feel you contributed to is in that, in that setting? Um, what was a, the lowest hanging fruit that you were able to pluck uh, in the chaos? 
Well, the law is hanging fruit was uh, that in terms of business registration in uh, Bulgaria, you used to need to go to basically a public notary and they had to look, is this you? Yes, this is you on your passport or on your driver's license. Give me literally $2,500 in Bulgaria, which is a, lo- a large amount of money, just so that I can basically attest that this is uh, you. Many countries have tried to remove this, but the notaries are fairly yeah, strong they, lobbies. The, the notaries so, will explain that it's extremely important Yes, but that, it's, that, it, that it's you. <laughs> and by the way, this is after you've gone to the public official, so they can also look at me and say, yeah, this is you. But, they need but a notary, they've got a knack. Exactly. It's not you know, well represented elsewhere. Yeah. So I managed as finance minister to remove that uh, step that cost me dearly later on because the head of the legal commission in parliament was a notary herself. So for the next four years, anytime An she, she managed to get me on a law, you know, she did get me. But this was a low hanging fruit. And has there been an, inc- was there an increase in, in business est- establishments in the aftermath of that reduction? And there was a, too, almost too large of an increase, which coincided <laughs> with Greece collapsing and yeah. a lot of Greek companies starting to register in Bulgaria. So it almost looked like, wow, you do some small thing, <laughs> and suddenly business registration explodes. But that's not a ridiculous uh, claim, because if the $2,500 thing had still been there, a lot of those Greek businesses probably wouldn't have moved over. So no, not it's, bad. It's correct. And since then, of course, uh, Greek businesses have continued to move to Bulgaria because one thing that we did manage to reform but also to maintain during the Eurozone crisis is low corporate uh, income tax rates. So Bulgaria, if you don't know, one thing to remember uh, from this, from my at least part of the conversation, has a flat tax, which is a dream for many uh, economists, which is 10% personal income tax, 10% corporate income tax, 0% dividends. So I'm a, I'm a fan of that in principle as well. Um, tend not to applaud on my own program, but um, how has the Bulgarian economy done? Again, many things have changed. We're recovering from a, a crisis. How's it, how did it do in 2010, 2011, 2012? Well, when, one way to say it is that when everybody around us, our neighbors, was going into very negative territory in terms of uh, economic collapse, minus 3, minus 5, minus 7%, Romania, uh, uh, Greece, uh, Serbia, Hungary, uh, and so on, we actually managed to maintain uh, above zero growth, which for the Eurozone crisis was a big success. We used to be one of only two countries together with Sweden to actually manage in 2010, 11, 12 have about one percentage uh, of economic growth uh, a year, given the neighborhood, right? So we, are, we have, you know, to the south, Greece, Be careful. to the north. The Russians, you know, <laughs> they, don't, they try to do that too, compare themselves to the neighborhood. But there are some neighborhood effects, and I don't want to deny it. Our neighborhood is more fun. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, But currently, the Bulgarian economy is growing at about 4 4.5% cent a year, which is... You Did know, you do any Keynesian stimulus uh, at the same time, which could explain it? Very little. Okay. Very little. And what happened to corporate, a more interesting question, what happened to corporate uh, revenue from the corporate tax that was reduced? Revenues did fall in the early period 2009, 2010, but then recovered quite nicely, much faster because you seem to have a sophisticated view of changes, much (laughs) faster than the average of the whole European Union, which is, I think, a good, not just our neighborhood, but the whole of the European Union. That's why they pay me the big bucks, I mean. Mm. Okay. Um, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to turn to Matt Warner, and uh, we're at an Atlas Network event, so everyone in the crowd knows what Atlas Network is about, but our listeners don't. Matt, tell us, remind us again what you do and why Atlas Network was interested in the Doing Business Report and how you're using it uh, in countries around the world. Sure. So Atlas Network is a non- nonprofit organization that is committed to economic opportunity all around the world. Um, that obviously has implications for economic development. Um, and as uh, independent organizations around the world that we work with um, in terms of benchmarking and identifying targets, um, it's important to look for tools that can help clarify and give some, um, uh, some uh, strategies around which to, to do the work. Um, for us, the conclusion has in, uh, recently been you know, 
when you look at economic development around the world in terms of an institution of, of a lot of different actors, uh, we think uh, we've got to start doing development differently. And one of the key things that is missing is uh, uh, putting a premium on locally grown solutions, led not by outsiders, but by the people there who have their own vision, their own understanding of the culture, and can lead to achieve reforms. You, using something like doing business report, um, it's one of the tools that can help um, provide some clarity to how to set out a vision, achieve something substantive, and then be able to measure the impact of that based on some of this uh, uh, good research that, uh, that, that, that Simeon has been doing. Um, a couple of ways that that plays out, for example, um, in India, you mentioned the, the Modi government. Um, we have a partner in India, Center for Civil Society, that's uh, an extremely robust organization. Uh, they're independent. They have uh, their own vision for change in terms of creating economic opportunity for all levels of, uh, of, of, of people in India. And they set out with a plan uh, about two and a half, three years ago, presented it to us and said, here's where we think we can make a difference. One of those things very explicitly was, some, uh, was eliminating minimum capital requirements for new businesses. Uh, the, uh, the India government had a policy that before you started business, you had to go show a, a bureaucrat and prove to him or her that you had 111.2% GDP per capita in your bank account as some sort of a proxy indicator that, um, that you were well set up to, to give that business a start. Now, um, from our point of view, uh, the decision or the conclusion about whether someone is prepared to start a business um, is, is a decision that's ho- that is wholly rested appropriately in the individual themselves who is bearing the risk and sees the opportunity and has the tacit knowledge to do something about it. So um, Center for Civil Society put together a very robust research and advocacy campaign that we supported um, in um, in helping explain why something like this is not good policy and is not going to lead to the kind of um, uh, economic opportunity and outcomes, particularly for low-income people that are disproportionately burdened by such a um, ar- somewhat arbitrary rule. Um, they did that. Um, part of their uh, multifaceted campaign was a robust social media outreach. Uh, one of their... Uh, one of their uh, Twitter, Twitter communications caught the eye of the relevant minister uh, in the Modi government who responded via Twitter and said, hey, let's get together and talk about this. And, um, and so they were able to have that kind of impact, and the result was the elimination of this minimum capital requirement, which impacts the scores on the Doing Business Index, which based on this research can, um, can uh, provide a bit of a tangible understanding of what that means in terms of uh, translating to about 126,000 people being able to lift themselves out of poverty, you know, year one, and that can, continuing as long as that good so, policy So your claim, exists. again, there was a big increase in, once that was eliminated, there was a, an actual vi- verifiable increase above trend in businesses starting? Exactly. There's, and, and in fact, even outside of the kind of tracking that we do, there are, are other organizations that are observing these kinds of responses to changes in doing business report in measuring those, those kinds of increase in, 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 uh, in, in registration. So we heard earlier about the French example where Macron was taking advantage of the fact that he's new, had made a campaign promise, has this measure as a way to translate into uh, maybe some internal political pressure for improvement. And similarly, maybe here, it's pretty clear to me that you, you could make some kind of case maybe that capital requirement, you don't want businesses going broke so often, so we need to require them to have a nice nest egg. But mainly it's, I presume, a way to keep other people from competing with you. So that's a really good change. Why would anyone not think that was a good idea who thought it was a good uh, uh, who, Why would anyone support getting rid of that given that before they thought it was, it was a good idea? And I guess some of that answer is new governments are always going to be a, a chance either for the fact that people are not ready to dig in their heels or just maybe that there's been a change in the underlying philosophy, ideology of the, of the voting public that this maybe is a good thing and that Modi is riding on that. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Well, I think one of the key things is that the insights and the assessments of what those opportunities are are not going to come from outsiders. Uh, it's going to come from the organizations within India who understand um, the, the dynamics of who's behind it, what kind of vested interest might be part of the problem, and to develop a strategy that's going to account for that um, in, in their pursuit to achieve something that's actually successful. Yeah, Simeon. Just to add on this point, um, people generally don't go to government to think, and I've discovered this myself. You don't have time to think, so you go and then you do, do things. So sometimes <laughs> it's as plain as there is a lot of ridiculous regulation around, and nobody in government has thought of what is this and what purpose What's does it serve? What's the full serve? range of impacts yeah, of these what does disparate... It serve? And if somebody like the Atlas Network's example comes and says, this is ridiculous, you don't need it, just remove it, Sometimes, not, not the majority of the times, unfortunately, but sometimes they say, yeah, this is ridiculous, let's remove it. Yeah. Yeah, let me give you another example where it, I, I think it was along those lines where um, an organization in Argentina just last year uh, came to us and said, hey, we've got a plan to eliminate what we think is a really bad tariff, a 35% tariff on laptops and tablets. And I think people just don't understand um, how harmful this is for our economy. You know, Ar- Argentina is in the bottom 10 on the Economic Freedom of the World Report. And so anyway... Another index that yep. measures different aspects of economic freedom. Exactly. And so, uh, and so they, they put together a plan, brought it to us. We uh, saw great promise in it and supported it. And within a year, because they were able to come up with analysis that made it very clear to whether you're, a tech, you're in a technical field or you're just someone uh, trying to live their life on the street, recognizing that, hey, here in Argentina, we're paying double what they're paying in Chile for the same computer products. We're paying three times what Americans are paying for the same computer products. And you've got you know, parents, school teachers, small business owners who need this technology to advance and become more efficient in what they're trying to do, increase education levels, which we know is really important. And so uh, by end, the end of spring, midsummer, they were able to uh, prevail upon uh, the, the Macri administration to eliminate that tariff. And so these kinds of uh, changes are possible in a short time window if you've got the right um, people who, are lo- who have the local vision and the local leadership to put together the right kind of plan. Something that an outsider may say, oh, yeah, it's not good to have a tariff because you know, we've looked around the world and we have this, you know, this sort of aggregate understanding of what's good policy. But to build that sort of um, that sort of sophisticated strategy internally to achieve it and make a difference, I think it's really got to come from the, the, the leadership of locals. And that implicates a role for outsiders limited to sort of philanthropic support, not necessarily a paternalistic, here's what you should be doing. Talk about uh, the South African example you shared with me earlier. Sure. In South Africa, that's a really interesting case and, and for me personally, fairly moving because um, there's a, 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 a civil society organization in South Africa that's committed to uh, ending the legacy of apartheid. Um, not everything that ended in 1994 went away completely. Uh, in the late 90s, you still had lots of people who were um, still living in, in, in government housing, didn't own their properties, even though there's a long history of, um, in some cases, their property being taken away by their parents or grandparents and not having restitution for that. Um, I, uh, this institute succeeded in changing the law and then went a step further to see the actual conversions from living in, in tenant housing to achieving land title for those same properties and they, they did it in a really sophisticated way in terms of understanding uh, local culture, building trust, using local uh, attorneys that the pe- people knew, achieving a bulk rate, and so lowering the costs of actually doing the administrative work to get the titling done. Um, someone that stands out to me that benefited from that, although there are many others, uh, was a woman named Maria Matupi, who at 99 years old received title to her land after living for decades um, in government housing. Of course, we know when you achieve land title, that gives you a lot more options economically in terms of you could sell the land, which the land that we're talking about 
at an average value of eight thousand U.S. dollars. Um, they can use the land as collateral to uh, access credit for investing in education or starting a business or something like that. For a woman at ninety nine, um, one is tempted to. Um, have mixed feelings about the celebratory nature of this achievement because it feels a little, little too little too late for someone who should have gotten um, better opportunities earlier. But she said something that really changed my mind about that and taught me something. She told the local institution that helped her do this, now I have something to leave my grandchildren. And so to recognize not only the importance of institutions like property rights and the norms that govern the behavior around, um, around the, the power of these things, but to see that she has tacit knowledge that no one else could attain, no, no, no technocrat could attain, to recognize why that's significant for her and what is important to her in terms of how to make use of that, of that newly found independence, economic independence, and what she wanted to do with that. Yeah, I mean, it also reminds us that not everything in an economy is about money, right? There's a pride there, and although starting businesses are an important part of uh, an organized society and the cooperation that's involved in the division of labor, it's uh, it's about a lot of things, human dignity and lots of things that we don't measure that, that are incredibly important, much more important probably than than money, unless you're starving to death, which, of course, in a lot of these cases, this, this can make a, a real difference in subsistence level, uh, of poverty and other things. Uh, I want to come back to a comment you made, reminded me when you said the India example, you said they did a study and they showed what some of the ramifications would be of getting rid of this uh, uh, capital minimum capital requirement. And it, it dawns on me that, I'd like to get both your responses to this, it dawns on me that you know, we're, we're, we're blessed to live in America, those of us are here in the room, many of us are from America, and we're blessed to live in a country where government is pretty transparent, uh, there is corruption, but it's not close to the corruption that are often in other places. We have an active press that's very effective. We have constitutional protection of that press, which uh, we should always cherish and be vigilant about. It's incredibly, incredibly important. At the same time, we also are more advanced at, at lobbying and <laughs> entrenched interests in a different way than, say, the family issues that, Simeon, that you mentioned in, say, a, a country like Morocco, where a nephew can get uh, special treatment we can worry about that today in America a little bit too, of course, but I think in a lot of countries it's more endemic and it's more very much uh, the standard way of doing business. So what, it, what crosses my mind is that you know, we have a lot of great think tanks in the United States. Uh, I'm in one, I hope, uh, the Hoover Institution. I mean, you're affiliated uh, with... The Peterson Institute. Right, the Peterson Institute. Uh, I've been in others. I've consumed a lot of interesting work from other think tanks across the political spectrum. And sometimes you wonder, you know, who's benefiting from those studies? Because it's very rare in the United States that somebody writes a study pointing out the bad things about some regulation and, and the minister of, of whatever tweets back, hey, that's a good point. Let's take care of that. Yeah. And that's because we've got this massive, big boat of government that is very hard to veer off anything that's current course of the status quo. So what are your thoughts on... Uh, what, what we might do in the United States or other developed countries uh, to make the kind of impact that I think you are having, Atlas Network seems to be having in certain small countries, which are making a big difference potentially. Some of those changes, those are, you just listed a few. They're, quote, small, but not to the people who are affected by them. They're life-changing, as you point out. Uh, and yet here, it's very hard. Um, maybe we need some grants to American think tanks <laughs> To be more effective. And of course, we have a lot of money here for think tanks. We're incredibly wealthy society by the standards of the rest of the world in most cases. And yet I often wonder about just how effective we are. You have any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's it's a depressing a... question, I have to admit. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's a depressing question. A depressing I'm sorry. Question. Um, well, the interesting thing is that gets to an overall topic about think tank effectiveness and productivity. And one of the exciting things that I think is happening is, you know, you go through uh, different um, uh, phases of uh, topics that animate people within this community about what's the next best thing, how can we improve. Um, measurement and results is sort of a perennial topic 
Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that at Atlas Network we have become very interested in is something I would, I would you know, um, in sort of a silly way call, you know, a call your shots method, um, like in billiards. Uh, or if you imagine... Babe Ruth. Yeah, oh, if you boy. imagine Babe Ruth looking to the outfield and, you know, it... it when, when you say, hey, I see something on the horizon that I think we can achieve, um, I think we have a way to do it, um, and I'm going to commit publicly to try to do that um, and put together a really sophisticated strategy and marketing plan. It's not just doing the research. The research is critical. You've got to have the credibility. You've got to know that what you're doing um, is built on uh, sound ideas. But to be able to communicate what, your, what the significance is of this kind of reform in a way that people consume information, and then being able to achieve that in a 12 to 24 month high uh, time horizon, it really adds credibility to this causal relationship. And I think as more and more research and advocacy organizations, civil society organizations, think tanks, et cetera, around the world can commit themselves to that kind of a model where they say, uh, here's what we want to achieve. It's going to be obvious whether we achieve it or not. We're not going to be able to hide if it's, if it, you know, or explain it away if it isn't, if it isn't what we wanted. Um, and, and then develop a track record that gives some confidence that that is uh, worthy of donor support to do it. Um, that is a model that I think we can uh, increasingly get confidence in seeing happen. So in the U.S. as well, I mean, we're, we're, our mission is to increase economic opportunity globally, not just outside the United States and internationally. We have partners in the U.S. Uh, who are doing this. And these are the very conversations that they're having um, about what does it mean to, be, to hold yourself accountable, achieve a real result. Uh, for example, in, a, in, in one cohort of investments that we've made over the last two and a half years, we invested in 29 countries uh, uh, with reforms tied to either doing business or economic freedom of the world. We've had wins in 10 of them. Based on Simeon's research, uh, that would translate to the equivalent to date of 405,000 people lifting themselves out of poverty as a result. Uh, based on what we've invested um, in all of the countries, not just the ones that win, that equates to about a $4.88 per person um, uh, outcome. And I think that's the direction that, that we need to move in, which is um, we don't have profit motive in the nonprofit world, but we can certainly hold ourselves accountable to some clear outcomes and then help in a friendly way encourage each other uh, to do better and better. Well, I really like the pre-commitment idea uh, I think that's interesting. I, you know, there's an incredible tension for me. I do like to measure things. People think I'm, I'm uh, because I'm skeptical about, say, econometric analysis. They think that, that facts don't matter. Well, of course they matter. Uh, outcomes matter a, a lot. And trying to measure things, to me, is always a good idea, as long as you remember that some of the most important things you do can't be measured. Uh, so I think the challenge there is a trade-off between demanding measurable outcomes and maybe missing out on some things that are harder to measure that you could achieve that you can't really get reliable data on. I, I think about this program I do, and you know, it's, uh, I use my downloads as a measure of my success. That's, of course, not my real measure, because I don't know if people actually listen after they download. I don't know if they understand it after they listen, and I don't know if they remember it, even if they do listen. And I don't know if it changes anybody's minds or teaches them anything or educates them, which is my fundamental goal. So I could try to measure that. I could have a test. I could, we could think of some different ways to do that. But fundamentally, I think what I'm doing, which is, I hope, trying to create, it sounds so pretentious, sorry, better public policy through better educated citizens. I like feeling I'm part of that. I'm also just entertaining and having people on their commutes, uh, which is part of life. But I like to think that, but I don't think I'll ever measure that. I don't think the dummy variable in 2006 for econ, econ talks Genesis is going to be a spike in economic growth or better well-being. I don't just care about growth, obviously, whatever measure we'd use. So I do think there's a trade-off there that's, that's very challenging. And I, you know, I salute you. For try, you have to actually have to spend money uh, in trying to allocate money to different activities. And obviously, doing that through something beyond just it feels right to me is probably a really good idea. So uh, even though I'm, I worry sometimes about over-measuring, I think it's a great point. 
Uh, Simeon, you want to add, add to those, those uh, ideas? I'm actually more optimistic uh, than, uh, than uh, you perhaps on the impact that think tanks have had uh, in terms of at least economic, uh, economic ideas. We spoke about tax policy, for example, 30 years ago when the last time that in the U.S. there was a significant tax, tax policy uh, change. Basically, it was uh, uh, the idea of several academics, some at Stanford, as it happens, uh, Hall and uh, Rabushka were coming with the first incidentally flat tax. Correct, and, we had a, and we, we've had an episode uh, with Alfred Bushka, and I will put a link up to it. Okay, uh, but then uh, uh, they actually worked, both of them, uh, in, uh, in uh, or with think tanks to develop this idea further. You can say, well, taxes were, during President uh, uh, Reagan's time, were indeed uh, reduced. We didn't quite get to a flat tax still. But actually, all of Eastern Europe did. So the reason that it's Eastern Europe, countries like Bulgaria, Slovakia, Estonia, Latvia, and so on, have a flat tax is that uh, the work of American think tanks and uh, academics in the early 80s, when uh, Eastern Europe uh, got rid finally of communism in 89, where do you look uh, to? Well, you look towards the U.S., there is this idea. 20, I think, of the 27, if you include the former Soviet Union, 20 currently of the 27 former communist countries have flat tax. That's all thanks to this, this idea wouldn't have existed without uh, the U.S. think tanks and academics. And the accountants in those countries all weep, but too bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, and can I just mention, there's a very interesting book out this year uh, by Matt Andrews, Lant Pritchett, and Michael Woodcock called Building State Capability because their conclusion in the face of what in the economic development space has become a very sort of self-consciously um, introspective awareness of uh, the ineffectiveness of aid uh, is, okay, so what ought we be doing to solve that problem? And um, for many of them, the answer is to really get focused on how to build state capability. And they come because up... Because the aid typically is going to flow through the state. So we know it hasn't been spent well in the past, so we need to improve the way it's spent in the future. And we've had many guests, Tony can talk, to, to try to think about how that might be improved. Right. And, and one of the adages that complicates this from that space is saying, well, we believe that the most transformative economic development programming is the least uh, likely to be measured in a persuasive way. The things that are easy to measure are the things that are least likely to be transformative. So they have this sort of conundrum. Um, and so, but I think what what happens is the the response then is to create a very um, technical and sophisticated and nuanced and um, um, complicated approach to helping bureaucracies in other countries discover for themselves what state capability looks like. And I think our message is, especially looking with inspiration at doing business report and economic freedom of the world report, is the reforms that are going to have the most impact and that, and that skirt that sort of conundrum that they're facing is things that rely less on really robust state capability without this bias that, in order for things to succeed, there has to be a really um, powerful, large, sophisticated, full of experienced technocratic body that's leading the way. And so if you can chip away at the things that state capa weak state capability is trying to do and not doing well but getting in the way of, then you can have some measurement about uh, we can identify those things work on achieving them within a timeline that makes it credible that, that those independent civil society organizations that have their own vision and led the way, they're the ones that achieved it, um, and then relate it to, to some of these findings about the impact on poverty. Simeon, last word? Reflect on this issue. Last word, I think even in countries like the United States, if we work hard, if we make the point that most regulation perhaps is not necessary or needs to be simplified, and most taxes perhaps can also be simplified and reduced, even in the U.S., finally, we'll have our word. 
And we see now that there is a movement towards let the U.S. become a normal country in terms of at least corporate taxation. My guests today have been Matt Warner, Stephen Yankov. Gentlemen, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.